Welcome to another lecture for interactive computer graphics. How are you all doing? So today's topic is geometry shaders. Yeah, we're talking about geometry shaders today. Now I can talk about geometry shaders pretty quickly. I can tell you how to write a geometry shader, I think in about like five, 10 minutes, but I am going to spend a whole hour on this topic because I would like you to understand why we have geometry shaders and what we can do with them and how they actually work in the, in the GPU. That's the more important part. So I'm not going to rush through this. I'm going to explain some of the details because I think those are going to be important when you decide to use geometry shaders for, for whatever it is that you're doing. So we're going to talk about pretty much all you need to know about geometry shaders, at least all that I think you should know about geometry shaders. All right, so let's start here. Let's start with the GPU graphics rendering pipeline that we've been looking at. We, we saw this before, you, this should look familiar, right? So we have our vertex data comes from here and then goes through the vertex shader and the rasterizer and the fragment shader. And, and finally with blending, I have my final rendered image, right? So we said, and then, you know, in the, the output of the vertex shader is going to be a bunch of vertices with some primitive connection. Uh, so the rasterizer, right before the rasterizer, that the primitives are connected, that the vertices are used to form primitives, and then those primitives, triangles basically, are used in the rasterizer for generating these fragments. And then in the fragment shader, I'm generating the fi final colors, right? So this was the pipeline that we've been using. Now, I had mentioned earlier that we had some optional extensions to this pipeline, and geometry shader is going to be one of them. And so a geometry shader, if you want to use it, will appear here in the vertex processing stage and it will get its data from the vertex shader and its output will directly go to the rasterizer, right? So that is, that is our topic today. Like, how do we do this? How do we put this geometry shader here? And what can we do with this? All right, now, so let's start from the beginning, let's start with the, the vertex shader. So I'm sending this vertex shader, so a bunch of vertices, like I'm, I'm rendering, let's say I'm rendering a, bu a bunch of triangles, I will be sending the vertices of my triangles to my vertex shader, right? So what's important here is that my vertex shader is going to get one vertex at a time. So it's going to get this, this one vertex, it's going to process that vertex, it's going to output that vertex, right? And then it's going to get the next vertex, it's going to output that, you know, apply whatever transformations that it needs to apply and whatever else it needs to do, and output that vertex. Same goes for the next vertex, and it will output that. So it will process them one by one. And then once I have these three forming a triangle, I'm going to send all three of them to a geometry shader. So this geometry shader is not going to get one vertex at a time, but it's going to get all three vertices at the same time. Right? That's how it differs from a typical, typical vertex shader. So it's going to be seeing the entire primitive, not just one vertex. All right? And after that, it will consume those vertices. It will basically do whatever it it wants to do with those vertices and it's going to output whatever it wants. It doesn't have to output the, the same number of vertices or it doesn't have to output anything that's related to what its input is. It's completely free to output whatever it wants. Like in this case, I'm outputting four vertices, right? Right. So the output for the geometry shader is going to be sent, is going to be a bunch of vertices. Let's say, let's say that this one is outputting four vertices. And of course, those four will be forming some primitive, right? Let's say that it's forming triangles. Let's say it's forming triangles like this. And of course, this is going to be sent to the, the, the rasterizer. <laughs> Getting in my face. Yeah, so, um, and after the rasterizer, of course, we have the fragment shader and all that, but we, we know all that stuff, right? We know what happens after the rasterizer. So what's important for us to talk about today is the stuff up to here, right? So this is going to go to the rasterizer. We know that. So we're outputting what the geometry shader is outputting whatever it wants. So what's important 
for us to understand here when we look at this picture is how the parallelism is working. So the vertex shader is looking at one vertex at a time. Why is it looking at one vertex at a time? Because it can look at multiple vertices in parallel, right? So I can have multiple executions of the same vertex shader, right? Each one of them will take up the, a, a different vertex. And of course, they will output the transform vertex, right? And this, this combined output is what I'm sending to my geometry shader. So there's more parallelism when it comes to doing some stuff on the vertex shader as opposed to the geometry shader. So this is a, an important point because when I talk about geometry shader, one, one question that people always ask is like, why do I need a vertex shader if I'm going to have a geometry shader here? Like the, my geometry shader could be getting this, this data without passing it through the vertex shader at all. Yes, it could, but I wouldn't have this level of parallelism if I do this, right? If I, if I pass this data directly to my geometry shader, it's going to look at one primitive at a time. So it's going to be looking at three, uh, three vertices, three vertices at a time, All right? So that's going to be the, the parallelism that I can achieve with geometry shader, but with vertex shaders, I'm looking at one vertex at a time. So if I have to do something per vertex in my geometry processing pipeline, if I need to do anything that's per vertex, I should probably do it in the vertex shader because that gives me more parallelism. But if I have to do something that's going to combine the information of different vertices together, that's the geometry shader is going to be the place to do that. Right? So more parallelism, less parallelism, but there is still parallelism, right? So it's not like geometry shader is, is sequential. It's just going to parallelize at a different level, at a triangle level. So if I'm rendering a bunch of triangles, my next triangle will be processed like this, and it's going to be, you know, the, these two geometry shader executions will run in parallel, and their outputs, of course, will be different, right? So that's, um, I, I'm still getting parallelism here. I ju I'm just not getting the same level of parallelism that I get in the vertex shader. On the other hand, on the other hand, inside a geometry shader, I have access to all vertices of my triangle. So if I need to do something that's going to involve figuring out how these different vertices relate to each other, then I'm going to have to do that inside the geometry shader because so, there I have access to all of the data. Here in the vertex shader, I don't have access to all the data, right? I just have access to a single vertex at a time. So this is the general pipeline. So when you think about geometry shaders, I would like you to imagine something like this. Right? So let's uh, dive a little deeper and talk about what we have inside this, this geometry shader, right? So we're looking at the geometry shader. What can we send to the geometry shader? And what can we get out of it? So inside the input to my geometry shader can be a whole bunch of different things. It could be the point, it could be a line, could be a triangle, right? I could be sending it like I'm drawing points, then my geometry shader is going to get a point. In that sense, it's going to be very much like a vertex shader in terms of parallelism. But of course, it's the way they process it and what it outputs is a little different. Uh, it, or it can get a line, in that case it's going to get two vertices, or it can get a triangle, in that case it's going to get three vertices, and its output is completely independent from what its input is. It has a bunch of outputs, possibilities. The output could be a, a bunch of points, um, line strips, or triangle strips. So those are the, the only possible outputs that a geometry shader can have. A geometry shader is free to choose its output completely independently from what its input is. So I can get a point as input and then I can output a bunch of triangles or a, a triangle strip. Or I can get a triangle as input and I can output whatever I want. But it will be able to output only one of these types. So a geometry shader can only output points or line strips or, or triangle strips. 
Right? It cannot be a combination of points and triangle strips. We can't do that. Right? That sort of simplifies the implementation too. So these are the input types that we are familiar with, actually, with the introduction of geometry shaders. The graphics API had different primitives in addition to these typical ones that we're familiar with. So the, these additional primitives that the geometry shader will be able to get are uh, going to be the line with adjacency and triangle with it adjacency. So these are the two types that are added to the geometry shader. Now these are a little there, there's some historical significance here as to why they're called these things. Uh, but because we can pretty much do whatever we want inside a geometry shader, it, the, this input definition doesn't matter too much. I'll, I'll, I'll get there a little bit. But uh, before I get into that detail, I want to briefly go over the types of primitives that we have in the API and how they relate to these types. So. Uh, here are the point and line related primitives that we have. So these, the top ones should be familiar to you. So points, obviously, lines. So they're going to be separate line segments. So if I send the same data as a, a line strip, it's going to form a, a connected strip like this. If I render a line loop, it's going to form a complete loop. All right. So I'm sending the same data with just different primitive type, and this is how the primitives are connected in standard OpenGL. So these are the new types that are added with the geometry shaders. So we have GL lines adjacency. That means that I am sending four vertices to define a single line segment be between vertex one and two in this case. And then the next four is going to define the next line segment. So basically, this this um, this very first vertex and the very last vertex of this group of four vertices, they're sort of not used as the part of that line primitive. But I'm going to be sending this stuff to my geometry shaders, and and geometry shader can can do whatever it wants with it. So this is used as a, as a way of sending some neighborhood data. If I'm rendering a, a line, a long line, then I, then I will have access to uh, the vertices before and after using lines adjacency. So this is how it's thought. And actually over here, it makes a, a, a bit more sense. If I use a line strip adjacency, in this case, uh, like every time my geometry shader runs, I will be getting four vertices. So for this, this first line segment, I'm getting the first four vertices. And this next line segment, for this next line segment, I'm going to be getting the next four vertices, these four, right? So there's an overlap of three vertices here. And the next line segment, I'm getting the, the next four and so forth. So in this case, my geometry shader runs two times, one for this and one for this. In this case, my geometry shader runs one, two, three, four, five times. Okay. And, and these are going to be, so these are the primitive types that I will use in, in my C++ code. When I issue my draw call, like GL draw arrays, but what I will be getting in the geometry shader is going to be these th 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 it's going to be these types right? so for points it's going to be points of course for all of these types of lines line types they're going to be lines and for a line with adjacency they're going to be line with adjacency so from the perspective of geometry shader uh, there are there are just three types points lines and lines with adjacency but i can issue them differently and depending on what exactly i want to do um, a, a different one would make sense. All right, so these are lines and point primitives. They're, of course, also triangle primitives, right? So we are familiar with these triangles. We've been using them. We talked about a triangle strip uh, a little bit when we were talking about triangles. So this is how a triangle strip is formed. This is a triangle fan. So it's forming a bunch of triangles a little bit differently. So my first vertex here, the second vertex here, the third vertex, 
generates a triangle and then the next one generates the next triangle next triangle so the the very first vertex is always used as a part of that as a part of a triangle All right so it's forming a fan around that first vertex triangle fan so it's it's useful for generating like cylinder caps or things like that uh, another one that's the new one that's added with the geometry shader is going to be uh, gel triangles adjacency so this is going to have a triangle and its neighboring vertices so if you want to do something in the geometry shader that would involve the neighboring vertices uh, on the mesh you can get the neighboring vertex information like this so this is sort of equivalent to sending separate triangles like for each triangle i'm sending its adjacency together or i can send them using a strip like this so this is gl triangle strip adjacency and this is the a the order that is used the order of vertices that is used for sending a strip with adjacency All right and from the perspective of the geometry shader the top ones will be seen as triangles and the geometry shader will just get one triangle at a time regardless of which one i use for rendering and down here for these two options I will be getting in my geometry shader a triangle adjacency, triangles adjacency, right? So that's going to be the type. All right, so writing using the syntax of the geometry shader. So this is going to be our input types and this is going to be our output types. I sort of colored them differently so you can see where they fall in the code when I see, show you the code. So here's the code for a geometry shader that does absolutely nothing not a very useful geometry shader i would say it's just empty <laughs> i just put three dots so i'm gonna have something inside here so okay so this is the initialization that i'm going to have to have so uh, this is saying that the geometry shader is accepting this input which is in this case it's triangles that means it's going to get a single triangle at a time so three vertices at a time and its output in this case i set it to line strips because why not? Another, another thing that we specify here is how many vertices my geometry shader will output, but its maximum number of vertices. So this is saying that I wrote my code such that my geometry shader will not output more than five vertices when it's outputting, outputting these triangle strips. And this is a useful thing that the compiler would do to figure out uh, how much buffer storage to, to allocate for storing the, for temporarily storing the output of the geometry shader and so forth. All right. So you don't have to, this of course, obviously this is maximum number of vertices. So that means that you don't have to output that many, but don't set it to something ridiculous. Like if you're just going to output three, just say three, or if you're just going to output two, just say two. So it can be, your code can be optimized accordingly. All right. Now, what is going to happen here in inside this code is that i'm going to get the data associated with these input vertices i'll show you how to do that i'm going to get all the data associated with these three vertices and i'm going to be outputting a bunch of vertices from scratch so i can i can output whatever i want as i said it doesn't have to have any connection to what my input is so if i'm if I'm getting triangles here and I'm outputting line strips, do I really care that I'm getting triangles as input? I and mean, what's important is that I'm getting three vertices. That's what's important, right? It's not that important that those three vertices actually meant a triangle. Because guess what? I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to, just eat that triangle inside this geometry shader and spit out something completely different, right? So it doesn't really matter that it is a triangle. So a, a, a better way of thinking about this, I think, is to think about these primitives as the kind of, as a method for sending different numbers of vertices to your geometry shader. So if I want to just send one vertex, I'm going to use points. If I want to send two vertices, I'm going to use lines, any of these line types that I've showed you earlier. If I want to send three vertices, it's going to be triangles, of course. Lines with adjacency will receive four vertices, and triangles with adjacency will get six vertices. 
So if I'm sending them separately, like separate points, obviously, or separate lines and separate triangles, separate line adjacency, but separate triangle adjacency, then it's just a matter of what numbers of vertices I'm sending. So the, the amount of information I'm sending it to my Geom Administrator. But if I am using any of the strip types, for example, if I'm sending line strips, if I'm sending line strips with adjacency or triangle strips with adjacency, then then what exact data I send to my vertex shader will be like, it, it's going to come from that strip, right? So yes, I'm sending this amount of data, but they are sort of overlapped with different executions of the geometry shader. In that sense, it would make a difference. But if I'm sending them separately, completely separately, then it doesn't really matter that I call them a triangle or line or whatever as input because its output is going to be completely independent, all right? So its output type is going to be this guy. This is not something that I showed you earlier, but this is actually the same output uh, as the vertex shader. Wait, this is input. <laughs> if this is the input, it's also going to be its output. So this is the input and it's the output of a vertex shader. Uh, we are familiar with this guy, right? The GL position. The other things that I can output, the optional outputs I have in my vertex shader are going to be the point size. I can output a specific point size per vertex. I can also output some uh, clip distances to uh, user-defined clip planes if I want to. We have that's not a topic that we talked about, and I'm not really planning to get into that. But yeah, it's it's there. Uh, so this is the a typical output for a vertex shader, and my geometry shader will get this as this GL in predefined variable. I don't have to define this in any way. I'm going to get this. But pay attention to these square braces here. That means this is an array. So GL in is actually an array and it's going to get an array of vertex data because I'm getting multiple vertices into my into my geometry shader. Right? That, that's why it's an array. And as I said, now this is its input. Its output is going to look very similar. <laughs> The same structure is going to be its output. So it is going to be outputting these things per vertex. So it's not outputting an array, but it's outputting one vertex at a time. So inside this code, I will be outputting multiple vertices. I'll, I'll, I'll show you, I'll, I'll show you how to do that. And each one of these vertices can have um, this information. It's definitely going to have a, a, a position, and then it can have a point size and clip distances as well. So, same type of input, same type of output. Of course, there can be custom stuff as well, and we're going to talk about that. All right, so let's see. This is our geom shader. Let's try to do something useful inside this geom shader. Okay, I'm going to do something not very useful first. All right, so I'm going to take this triangle. And I'm going to output something very, very simple out of this. All right. So let's see. Here's a full code for a geometry shader for you. This geometry shader, what it's doing here is that it's setting GL position, just like a vertex shader, setting GL position to one of the input vertices GL position. So it's taking the first vertex, vertex zero from GL in zero, and it's its position, it's setting the position of this input to this output position. And it's calling this magical function here. It's called emit vertex. So as soon as I call this, my geometry shader will be outputting that vertex. So it's, it basically copied that information to the output buffer. Then I'm setting GL position to something else. I'm setting this GL position, the same variable, same output variable to something else. I'm setting it to the first vert vertex, uh, the GL position of the first vertex. And then I'm emitting it again. So can you imagine what this is doing? It's getting a triangle and it's outputting two vertices as a triangle strip type. That's perfectly fine to output just two vertices. So let's see, let's see what it does. It's over here. So it's getting a triangle, right? And three vertices. 
and it's all three vertices will end up here in the geometry shader and it's outputting the first vertex and the second vertex. And it's not changing anything, it's just outputting them as they are. So what if I, what, what do I do with the third vertex? Well, in this case, I'm not doing anything with it. <laughs> so it's probably not great. Maybe I want to output that as well. Let, let, let me do that. I'm outputting the third vertex too. So what happened now? Now I outputted the third vertex too. So this was a triangle that was sent as a triangle, but inside my geometry shader, I intercepted that data before it went to the rasterizer. I intercepted it and I converted it to two line segments. So I outputted these three vertices and it ended up being two line segments because I'm outputting a line strip. The output type is line strip, so I'm outputting a line strip. So this triangle turned into two line segments. So, for example, I could use this kind of an this kind of a geometry shader to draw the edges of my mesh. When I'm when I'm rendering a triangular mesh, I can I can intercept these triangles in the geometry shader, and I can convert those triangles to a bunch of line strips and to draw the, the edges. But I'm missing an edge here, right? Because this is not a line loop, it's a line strip. The output type can only be line strip. So if I want to connect it, I'm gonna to have to add another, uh, I'm gonna to have to emit a fourth vertex. But let's, uh, let, let, let's do something fun. Instead of just emitting that fourth vertex, which could be this, this first one, so that would close this loop, I'm going to emit something else. I'm going to ha I don't have to emit the same vertex position that I'm receiving as an input. I can emit whatever I want. I can do whatever computation that I want to do to compute the, the new GL position. And I can just emit that, right? And this, in this simple case, what it's doing is that it's taking an av the average of these two positions. So the position of the first vertex and the third vertex. So it's going to be a position in the middle here right in the middle here and that's what I'm outputting. So now with this geometry shader the output becomes these three line segments. All right? So what if what if this is not exactly I, what I wanted? What if I wanted to emit disjointed line segments? Like I wanted to emit this one that's this first one generated by these two vertices. And then I wanted to output these two, but, but not that, that connected line strip. Can I do that? Actually, I can do that very easily in a geometry shader. Yes, its output is a line strip, but it's not necessarily a single line strip. It can output multiple line strips. And I can tell, the, ge the geometry shader can tell when the strip should be cut. So I can basically end a primitive at any time I want by calling end primitive. So when I do this, I'm emitting two vertices. They're forming this line segment. And then I'm ending the primitive. So the next vertex is going to start a new primitive. Okay, so this way I can have multiple line strips. In this case, I'm just outputting multiple lines, line segments. But I can have multiple line strips. I can have multiple triangle strips that are going to be disjoint from each other right, by using n primitive. All right, but as you see at the very end, I didn't call n primitive. I can, but I don't have to because yeah, when the execution ends, the primitive will end. Obviously, that's you don't have to explicitly say that. All right, so we are. Let's say how we could get some other types of information into our geometry shader. So our vertex shader can output all sorts of stuff. For example, I could be outputting some, some data. <laughs> Let's call it some data, whatever, per vertex data. And that's going to be output, that, that's going to be a, the, a, one of the outputs of my vertex shader. And I can send it to my geometry shader just like this, just like getting that getting that, that custom data to your fragment shader. I can, I, sending that custom data to your fragment shader from your vertex shader, I can send it the very same way. I can send it to my geometry shader. 
The only difference is that, so this is a, a single value and over here I'm receiving this as an array because Java Administrator is going to receive an array of points. Right? And then I can, I can do whatever I want with it. Actually, I don't even have to use the output GL position in my geometry shader, right? I can completely compute a whole new position from scratch. I can use it if I want to, but I don't have to. I can, I can do something like this. Maybe this, the sum data, whatever it is, is the X, Y coordinate. Then I specify Z, Z and W are just one. This would be totally fine, right? Or I can do whatever complicated computation I'm going to have to do here to compute the position, GL position. I, it can, I, I can compute it however I want. So I have complete flexibility here. But let's, let's go back and say that I'm just, I'm boring. I'm just outputting the same data. All right. So can I have, can I have a, uh, an, an output? Yeah, absolutely. I can output stuff to my, it's a custom output to my, what comes next? rasterizer and then the fragment shader. Yeah, so I can output data to the fragment shader. So let's say that this V data is what I'm outputting. I just call it V data. I could call it whatever I want, right? So if I want to set this data, so as you can see, this is not a an, an array. This is just a, a single value, single vector. So I'm going to set the single vector value here before I emit my vertex. I set it set it to whatever I want. In this case, I'm just passing this, this data to the fragment shader by copying it over to, to V data. So I just copied it over and I emitted the vertex. So this is how I can pass data from my vertex shader all the way to my fragment shader by passing it through my geometry shader, right? Of course, I can do whatever I want with it, right? I don't have to directly pass it. I can do some computation here and I can send it, send whatever, whatever, whatever I want to my fragment shader. For example, I can send the barycentric coordinates of each vertex here. So as I'm emitting a vertex, I can send its barycentric coordinates. The first vertex is going to be one, zero, zero. The second vertex is going to be zero, one, zero. The third vertex is going to be zero, zero, one. And when I send it to my fragment shader, my fragment shader will not receive this data directly. It will receive whatever it gets from the rasterizer, right? So rasterizer, rasterizer is getting the output from the geometry shader over here. My rasterizer is getting, and my fragment shader is getting whatever rasterizer output. So over here, my fragment shader is going to get the interpolated value. So this, this V data value that I'm getting in the fragment shader is going to be the interpolated value, right? So if I output very centered coordinates, just as I told you, like one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, I'm going to get the interpolated very centered coordinate that corresponds to this fragment inside my fragment shader, right? So this is how you can send, this is how you can send very centered coordinates to your fragment shaders. All right. And another thing to notice here is that I'm setting the setting these output variables and then I'm emitting a vertex. I don't necessarily have to set set these variables from scratch every time. So if I emit another vertex without modifying V data here, which was my one of my outputs, then the same V data will be sent uh, as a part of the second vertex. Okay, so I don't have to specify it every time. So you will see when I show you the examples, the geometry shader is going to be used for, for generating data on the fly. So whenever I have some, some data that I want to generate and I don't want to pass that data through the graphics pipeline, but I can generate it from some minimal data. That, that's a very, very good place for the geometry shader. So let's uh, talk about that. All right. What else? Of course, in my geometry shader, I can have uniform variables just like any other kind of shader. I can send whatever floats something, whatever this. 
So this is also fine, just like any other shader. All right, so this is the geometry shader overview, right? This is the input and this is the vertex shader. It just gets the data from the, the vertex shader. Another thing that I might want to do inside a geometry shader is that I might want to, you know, we sort of mentioned this, I might want to output multiple primitives. So for example, uh, I can use these three input vertices to generate these two triangles. Maybe I want to use the same three vertices to generate an, an, another two triangles as well. So it's called, uh, we, we refer to this as instancing, although instancing is used for other things as well. Uh, so this is geometry shader instancing that if I have a geometry shader that uses the same data to output two completely different independent things, instead of doing this inside a single geometry shader execution, I can instance my geometry shader and I can have two instances of my geometry shader running with the same data. So I can take this and split it into two. I can have two instances such that the first instance outputs this and the second instance outputs that one. So I can get some parallelism here in the geometry shader as well if my output is something like this. Both of them will get the same input, but their output is going to be different, right? And instancing is very, very easy to set in the geometry shader. You just say, hey, I'm going to have two instances here. I, my input is triangles and I'm going to have two invocations is what it's called. So when you're running your geometry shader inside your geometry shader, you're going to have an invocation ID. So you can say, if it's invocation ID zero, I'm going to do something. If it's invocation ID one, I'm going to do something else, right? Uh, or better yet, if you can use this invocation ID as like an integer in your evaluation, that that's even better. So you can you can do something like this. So this 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 is set such that my first execution, first invocation, is outputting a line segment that is using vertex 0 and 1. My second invocation is outputting a line segment that's going from 1 to 2, vertex 1 to vertex 2. So I could be outputting two line segments, uh, but the, by doing this, I can do this in, in parallel, right? So if you are outputting three edges of a triangle, then you might want to have three invocations and use a geometry shader like this, so that would output the, the three edges. The, the advantage here is that this is going to run in, in parallel. These invocations will run in parallel. All right, so this is a geometry shader. What I haven't told you is what to do in here. As you can see, like we're not really, like all these examples I showed you were very, very simple. We're just passing data on. But this is GLSL code. You can write whatever you want here. So we have this complete freedom of getting this input data before it reaches the rasterizer and converting it into whatever we want using whatever code we want. And over here, we have access to all sorts of things. We, we have access to all the information that was passed from the vertex shader. And we can send whatever information we want to your to the fragment shader. Uh, we can have access to uniform variables. We have access to textures. So we can we can do all sorts of things inside a geometry shader. It's a very, very powerful shader. It's one of the well in the graphics rendering pipeline, it's like one of the most powerful shaders we have because its input and output are totally flexible. All right, so in the rest of this, the time that we have in this lecture, I am planning to talk about different examples of what you could do with, with geometry shaders. So here's one example uh, that I, I really like. I, here's some glass blades generated using the geometry shader. Uh, and they're, they're, they're animated uh, as well. Uh, in the in the geometry shader, I believe the input here. That's a this tutorial. You can actually check out the the code. Uh, the input here, but it's a Unity engine. It's 
the input here, I believe, is just the, the, the surface mesh. And from the surface mesh, from these triangles, the geometry is out, uh, the geometry shader is outputting these grass blades. I, I, I think that's a pretty cool example showing the kinds of things that you can do with the geometry shader. Uh, let me show you another example. So in this case, the geometry shader is taking the mesh with its, with its triangles and then creating this, this explosion-like motion. Of course, this, this motion could be... Now, in this case, the motion is relatively simple. It's just everything is just going in uh, sort of random directions. It's not really... It's just going away from the, 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 the center. I believe it, they're moving in the surface normal direction. So it's uh, from each triangle, it's generating a bunch of triangles and it's sending them far off in the vertex normal direction. But every time, every frame, I'm rendering exactly the same object, at exactly the same position. The only thing that's different for each frame is time. So depending on time in the geometry shader, I am moving these triangles I'm generating further and further away in the in the normal direction. I say I am doing it, but it's not actually me. <laughs> this is uh, an example created by someone else, right? So it's just showing the kinds of things that you could do. Yeah, you could use them for explosions. But probably one of the most common ways of using uh, geometry shaders would be about uh, rendering with billboards. So billboard, billboard particles. So these images that I'm showing you are from, from this tutorial about using Blender for billboard rendering for offline purposes, but you can ex do exactly the same thing on the GPU. So in this example, let's say I have this train and I'm gonna have some smoke coming out of this steam engine. And for that smoke, I can use a particle system. I'm generating a, a bunch of particles. Think about them as uh, points, a bunch of points. You can fairly easily simulate their, their positions or write some mathematical function that generates these, these positions. What's important here and what the billboards are used are that we're going to take these points, these point particles, and we're going to convert them into something that will look like smoke. And the way we're going to do that is that we're going to use some, some smoke texture like this. Right? This is a smoke texture. In this case, you can think about this, this black part is like transparency. So using the, a smoke texture like this uh, with alpha blending, I can take each one of these particles and I can convert them into a, a quad like this. Right? And if I convert my particles, these points, to, to quads and, and put the, this texture on them. I'm going to put the texture in the fragment shader, of course. I can get something, when rendered, would look like smoke. Now, this is offline rendering in, inside Blender, I believe, but you can do the very same trick uh, on the GPU. So a lot of GPU smoke that you see is actually rendered using this trick. So here the, the important part for the geometry shader, the, the part that the geometry shader plays here, is taking these points as input and outputting these quads. These, these quads. And oftentimes these quads, uh, when we're using billboard rendering, so these are called billboards, oftentimes these types of Billboards would be camera facing billboards. So they would be facing towards the camera. Because if I look at them from the side, <laughs> from over here, right? I, if I look at them from the side, I won't, it won't quite look like smoke. Uh, for it to look like smoke, I need to see the texture facing the, the camera. So these quads will be oriented to face the camera. And what the geometry shader can do is that it can take these points and it can output these camera facing quads. Uh, that's a 
Not, not, not too hard to do, actually. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do that. You, you, can, you can do that fairly easily by generating these quads in the, the canonical view volume. Uh, or, of course, you kind of need to make sure that their, their size is going to be correct. Or you can just do uh, use the camera space and then project them. Right. Right. So this is a very common way of rendering smoke and fire and all sorts of visual effects if they are simulated using particle systems like this, right? And the, the, the final results would look, would look quite convincing, especially if you're using a lot of particles, the final results can be quite convincing. But just to, just to be clear, this is not real-time render on the GPU. Right? This is rendered in Blender, this is an offline render example. I, I picked this one because it had pretty good visualizations showing how this billboard rendering is done. So when the geometry traders came out, one of the things that people wanted to use them for and use them for was this whole concept of tessellation slash subdivision. So let me talk about this a little bit. Tessellation is the concept of taking a, a primitive, let's say a triangle, and splitting it into multiple primitives like so. So this is one way of doing tessellation. Now, why would I want to do that? I had a triangle, now I have more triangles to work with. Because I can do things to this triangle, these, this collection of triangles that I couldn't do to this one triangle. For example, I can, I can then move these vertices a little bit, right? So I can have a, a different shape. And this is, this is the concept of subdivision. Uh, subdivision uses this tessellation a lot. It's, it's used a lot in computer graphics. Uh, oftentimes we model objects using a low resolution representations and then we render them using high resolution representations after subdivision. So this is at multiple levels of, I believe in this case, this is Cutmore-Clark subdivision applied to, to a box and you get a shape that sort of resembles a sphere. It's not exactly a sphere, but it's yeah, it kind of looks like a sphere. It's a little deformed sphere. So this is a very, very common operation used in, in graphics for generating models. But the, the reason why we would like to use them on the GPU, that we would like to have tessellation on the GPU, is that so that we can render objects with, with different resolution. For example, I can send this one as my object to my rendering pipeline and inside my rendering pipeline let's say on the geometry shader i can generate more triangles out of it and get a much more detailed geometry now why would i want to do that because this way i'm i'm sort of optimizing the data movement i'm sending less data to my vertex shader and i am rendering a lot more triangles this is going to make the rendering rendering pipeline quite a bit more efficient Another thing that it does is that if that, this, this, this object is far, far away from the camera, maybe that, that resolution is good enough. Maybe I don't need to generate this many triangles. So on the fly, inside the geometry shader, I can decide whether or not I want to generate more triangles like this. Now, people use geometry shaders for, for this sort of stuff because you can. Why wouldn't you? It's, it's great. But... Actually, geometry shaders are not quite optimized for this very operation. So this is a very, very common operation. It's done a lot for, for all sorts of things, well, for, for tessellation, uh, either for level of detail, that's having different levels of detail, different resolution representations of a, a model, or just generating on-the-fly data as you're rendering. This is a very common operation, so we ended up having a different shader for it. Yes, you can do this in the geometry shader. Yes, people have done it in the geometry shader. But now we have a dedicated shader for this. That's that's a tessellation shader. And we're going to talk about the tessellation shaders next time. But you can do tessellation in the geometry shader. Uh, you probably shouldn't because we have a dedicated shader for that. But with just, uh, just a teaser for uh, what we're going to talk about next is the tessellation shader is in example tessellation shader uh, output so this is the input to the tessellation shader 
Uh, it's a very low resolution, low resolution object and it's the output can be made to something like this with lots and lots of triangles with lots of detail. Uh, and there's quite a lot of savings here in, in terms of what you what the data that you send through the rendering pipeline. So rendering this many triangles without using tessellation would be quite a bit more expensive actually. And in the end, you can have some uh, really uh, high level of high levels of geometric detail in your renders, even though the scene you're rendering actually has, well, the, the, the data that you're sending to your GPU for rendering is a lot less than the number of triangles used for rendering this image. And this way we're generating data on the fly. Now this is going to be our topic for uh, next time. So, and today's lecture was just about geometry. I just wanted to mention that you can do tessellation in geometry. Shader. And I will say you probably shouldn't because we have a dedicated shader for that. That's going to be a bit more, quite a bit more efficient. Yep, and, and I'll see you in the tessellation shader discussion next week. All right, bye everyone.